everyone and welcome to another video by BioTeach. This time we're looking at the very first required practical which is based on the effect of a named variable on the rate of an enzyme controlled reaction. I'm basing this video on the experiment I conduct with my students which is usually looking at the effect of temperature on the rate of the reaction and the enzyme that we use in this experiment is trypsin. I would just like to say that this particular video whilst it is more suitable for the AQA level biology this topic and the experiment does come up a lot in the BTEC Applied Science, specifically in Units 3, Units 6 potentially, and in Units 10. So this is suitable for the BTEC Applied Science as well. I mentioned trypsin in one of my earlier videos. It's the enzyme that helps digest proteins, and it is produced in the pancreas. The protein that trypsin will digest in this experiment is known as casein, which is the main protein that's found in milk. The theory behind this practical is that when we add trypsin into a dilute solution of milk powder, the casein will be digested and the solution will go clear. I guess from your knowledge of how temperature may affect the enzyme, you might be able to hypothesize that the time taken for the milk to go clear will decrease as the temperature increases. But of course, this depends on how high a temperature we test up to. So the method outlined on here is usually what I would have up on the board for my students to refer to as they carry out the experiment. Of course, you will probably have your own method sheets that your teacher gives you in class, so you can refer to them whilst you're at your bench working. The first step highlighted here is to draw an X with a marker pen on the side of the test tubes. I usually recommend you do this close to the bottom part of the tube, as this is the part where the liquid is going to be. You would add the milk solution to three test tubes and in another three test tubes you will add the enzyme and the buffer. If you have not heard of buffer solution before, you should note down that this is used to ensure that the pH remains stable or constant. So why do we want the pH to stay the same? Well, we know that pH is one of the factors that affects enzyme activity. So if the pH changes, it could affect our results and skew our data. That would mean that our data and our experiment would be inaccurate. When doing these practicals, we need to make sure all other factors are kept constant and only this temperature is changed. So once we have our three test tubes with milk and the three with enzyme and buffer, we stand all six tubes in a water bath at a temperature of 20 degrees and we leave them in there for about 10 minutes so that the contents are all the same temperature. When you do this in class, you might get asked to do 20 degrees, another student might get asked to do 30 degrees, and another student might get asked to do 40, and so on. And your teacher might ask you to pull your results as a class, so that's just something to be aware of. Another thing to note at this stage is that you have three test tubes as you were doing three readings at the same temperature. Don't forget, when we do experiments, we do multiple trials in order to obtain a mean so that we can measure the repeatability and accuracy of our experiment and our data. Once the 10 minutes is up and the temperature of the contents of the tubes is the same, we would mix up one of the tubes with the enzyme buffer and the milk solution. By putting a bung at the end and inverting it, we are mixing it properly. Then we would put it back into the water bath. We repeat the same with the other two test tubes, and so all three test tubes go into the water bath, and we time how long it takes for the milk to go clear. Basically, you look at the tubes to see when that X at the bottom of your tube appears through the milk solution. You would record the time taken in a suitable table, and then using this method, and if you've got time, you could test other temperatures. I usually ask my students to do 20, 30, 40, 50 and 60 degrees to get a good range, but of course you might do 25, 30, 35, 40, 45 and so on. After collecting your data, you would record your data in a suitable table and I've got a draft of that in a second. And then you could process your data and draw a graph of that to represent what you found. So from previous years, I've been able to gather a decent set of data from students' experiments. I'm going to share this with you in a second. But firstly, I need to mention that this is raw data that's been collected. You have to be aware of what raw data is. By definition, it is data which has been collected that has not undergone any calculations. It also tends to be in an unsuitable format to perform direct data analysis on. What I mean by this 
is that it could be in two different units, so minutes and seconds, or we've got lots of data points and we haven't actually got the mean yet. So the raw data table looks something like this. As the temperature was our independent variable, that part of the data always goes on the left-hand side of the table. And then we have our raw data we collected from our three trials at those temperatures that are shown. Please note that this time on this data table, I've gone with 25, 30, 35, 40, and 45. So those are the temperatures that my students would have collected the data for. So we can see here that we've got five temperatures that were tested. And overall, we can see that as the temperature increased, we saw the X appear quick, especially between 25 and 40 degrees. But at 45 degrees, it seems it took a touch longer to appear. I also want you to note that the time taken for the X to appear is in minutes and seconds. So we need to kind of manipulate this data, do some calculations in order to be able to represent this in a graph, even to be able to represent it as a mean. And so this is where the processed data comes in. This is another definition that you need to know. Processed data is obtained from the raw data or calculated from the raw data table. Usually, we have to convert the raw data into the same units of measure. So in our case, we would need to go from minutes and seconds to just seconds. Working in just one unit or working in seconds makes it easier for us to calculate the mean and potentially to do other calculations or statistical analysis. So if I was to draw a process data table, this is roughly what it would look like. You can see the temperature column is in the same place on the left hand side, but now we have some changes. The next three columns are for the time taken for the X to appear in seconds only and for the three trials separately. And then there is a mean time column. There is also a rate column at the end, which is looking at the one over time. Let's take our first calculation. In our raw data table, for 25 degrees, we had the trial 1 reading for 4 minutes and 6 seconds. It always surprises me how many students get the basics of this part incorrect. I find students will get their calculators and type in 4 minutes 6 or 4.06 and simply multiply that by 60. But don't forget that converting minutes into seconds doesn't work like that. I also get students who would type in 4.06 plus 4.13 plus 3.59 into a calculator and then divide the total by 3 and tell me that the answer they get is the mean time taken. Those students usually get a bit of a telling off because they fail to use their brains as well as their common sense. In order to calculate the mean, you must convert the minute portion first by multiplying that by 60 and then adding on the seconds. So in this particular example, we would have 4 minutes 6 seconds converted into 246 seconds, 4 minutes 13 seconds into 253 seconds, and 3 minutes 59 seconds into 239 seconds. We can then easily work out the mean, which goes into the column where it says mean time, and then we can do 1 divided by the mean to work out the rate. I think working to three decimal places is pretty sensible at this stage. So this is the process data for 30 degrees. You can see the minutes and seconds converted into seconds only, then the average and the rate on the right. Then you've got the 35 degree one. This is the 40 degree calculations. And finally, the 45 degree calculations. Now, when you look at this data, you should be able to identify any anomalous results, any results that don't follow the overall pattern and at that point you can make a decision as to whether to exclude them or still to include them if they do follow the pattern but they're just a little bit lower than what you'd expect. Now when I look at this table I look at those ugly decimals under the rate column and dread to think how I'm going to plot them on a graph. When working with really small numbers in rate calculations we have to learn to multiply them or by a larger number, such as 100, 1,000, or even 10,000. And we have to multiply each of those data points by the same number. So if I multiply 0 0.004 by 1,000, I would have to multiply all of the rest by 1,000 also. And we do this just to make them a little bit more plottable, or I normally say to my students, well, I want to make them prettier so I can plot them properly on a graph. 
So in this example, I've multiplied all of the rate figures by a thousand or 10 to the three, and I've got the numbers in the last column as whole numbers. So we can actually scale that on the y axis and work with that data to produce a really nice graph. This is the point where I say to my students, look at these numbers, they're so much prettier to deal with. We can deal with 4, 8, 11, 16, and 12 much better than their decimal forms as 0.004. So once you manage to get this far, your graph should look something like this. Remember, your graph should always have a title. You should have uh, the temperature and the units on the x axis and the rate and the units on the y axis. And the graph should show you a line graph with the optimum temperature around 40 degrees. The key thing to note here is that in an exam, you might get asked to do some data calculations and work out the rates as well as plot a graph. Usually questions like this are worth three marks, but just getting the axes, titles and the units in the correct place will get you two of those three marks. It is important that you know how to do this so you don't miss out on crucial points, even if your calculations are wrong. Usually questions based on required practical one are on pH, the use of buffers, factors affecting enzyme activity, and explaining type questions, where you have to state why you have to carry out the method that you have to carry out. Why do we use a buffer? Why do we use a timer? Why do we use multiple trials? Why do we even bother working out a mean? So those are the types of questions that you have to prepare yourself for. Okay guys, so I hope that helps you understand the first practical. Don't forget that this is useful for A-level biology as well as the BTEC Applied Science Unit 3, Unit 6 and Unit 10. Thank you so much for watching.